Welcome everyone. I know uh, people are still entering the room, so take a seat, find someone to sit next to. It's so good to have you join us today. We're just giving people a chance to, to enter in. All right, I think uh, we can get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Felice Noodleman. I'm the uh, Associate Vice President of Academic Innovation and Transformation at ASCU. And I'm joined by just some phenomenal uh, folks today. Uh, Rennie Eborn, Associate Vice President for Strategic Innovations and Deputy of Digital Transformation at Utah State University. Dr. Bernard Mayer, Senior Vice President Academic Affairs and Chief Academic Officer at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, and Dr. Amy Smith, Chief Learning Officer of Straighter Line. It, I'm so glad you could join us today uh, for this incredibly important conversation. We're going to dive right into the topic, and um, it, it, let me give a little bit of context for this webinar and how we're going to proceed today. Utah State and Straighter Line created a case study about Utah State's earned admissions program, which has been successful in helping learners who do not meet admissions requirements enroll at the university. Utah State will explain how the program works and what the outcomes have been up to date. That will be followed by a panel discussion about how expanding access can help institutions both live out their missions and address problems caused by the enrollment declines that we've all been seeing. We'll finish with about 10 minutes of audience Q&A, and we'd like you to submit your questions via the chat. Um, so please feel free, but you don't have to wait till the Q&A portion. We'll be tracking the questions all along. So without further ado, it is really a great honor to uh, turn this over to Renee Earborn. Thank you so much, Renee. Yes, thank you. Um, and as um, as police mentioned, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Utah State University and some of our challenges. I'm going to share um, a little bit of um, information regarding our pilot um, and our project that we did and our initiative we did with Straighter Line, and then talk about how that is going to be impactful for our future. And so, um, for those of you that are not familiar. Um, with Utah State University. Utah State University is a gorgeous um, institution in one of the most scenic states in the country. Um, half of our campuses and our centers are like located near six national parks and natural wonders. And then our main campus, which is located in Northern Utah is near minutes from two large mountain ranges, as well as a half a day's drive um, from Yellowstone. Um, Utah State, we have been ranked um, public as a public University, um, according to Washington, as being one of the most beautiful campuses um, in 2008 and the best value schools. And, um, and it, it really does um, look like Hogwarts with winter sports, especially this time of year. It's a beautiful place to be. And we really care a lot about um, our students. Um, where we have university campuses across the state, we have Aggies um, and, and other across the nation, we have Aggies everywhere, and it's really important to us that um, our students have the same experiences at our campuses as they do as being online or whether they're um, that they're not they're post traditional students sometimes. And so we we really want to have all of our Aggies everywhere have the ability to be able to have um, you know the access to some of the various learning resources that we have on our campus. We want them to have that peer-to-peer -peer connection. We want them to be able to have personalized communication and we want them to be able to meet with advisors and really engage and connect with each other um, and be able to do that. And so um, as we took a look at um, that, if you go to the next slide, as we took a look at the last year or two with what we were, what we were working on, 
we real we wondered if we were actually doing what we said we were doing. Um, Utah State University is a land grant um, school, and so we have um, a three prong mission, and one of those is access, expanding access to education, and. We wanted, we really looked closely at ourselves to make it, to look to see if we really were um, fulfilling our role um, to increase access to high quality education throughout, for students throughout the state of Utah, as well as the nation. At the same time, we wanted to make sure that we kept um, a set of admission requirements to ensure that those that do enroll really thrive when they come to our campus and when they come and um, start their educational journey. And um, this started creating kind of a concern for our leadership team as we started looking at we were we wondered if we were leaving too many aspiring learners behind. Um, and we took it because we did, you know, have these admission standards. So we took a internal look at ourselves and our processes and we wondered where we could improve and how we could do this differently. And we started to think differently about how we could help students um, who perhaps who perhaps weren't as prepared and so what we, we decided to do is we worked um, with Straighter Line and we decided not to change our, our standards for entry, but to provide some supported pathways for students who may not initially be able to meet um, our initial um, standards. And so that's kind of what we did is we worked with Straighter Line and we, um, we started a pilot program that would offer prospective students a chance to earn their admissions through pre-coursework. Um, so students that no longer, that couldn't meet our requirements for admissions, no longer would receive a denial letter. Instead of saying, you know, you, you don't meet our requirements. Instead there, the communication changed and the message changed that said, you know, this is the pathway for you to be able to come and thrive at Utah State and be part of our Aggie family. And those students then were directed to an um, earned admissions program that was primarily um, operated by Straighter Line to begin their academic journey. And, um, and most importantly, the, the students were told this before they even, um, even apply to the university, um, they're, they're able to do this. And um, we really wanted this to be a low risk opportunity, um, a pilot that it was a very low risk opportunity so that um, students, there was no harm to our students that did this. And so we created, you know, a path and a journey with Straighter Line to do this pilot. And we started it and we started it in um, planning it clear back in 2018. And then in when COVID happened, um, we we launched it during the 2020 year of during the pandemic. And we were able to pilot this for um, two semesters and then learn from that and make changes and be innovative as we move forward um, in, in doing that. And so a little bit about um, kind of how it was successful. Some of our keys to, I feel like it was a successful pilot in the implementation is there are three or four things that I think always work really well when you're doing something like this in, in higher ed. And first of all, is you need to have high level sponsorship. Um, so um, we made sure that at our institution that um, we had people involved that were in leadership positions, um, our provost office, our president, um, we had a very high level sponsorship, which was um, very um, key to being successful in launching this pilot. We also um, implemented some um, inclusive stakeholdership and we made sure that we the, the people across campus were involved. And we also, you know, had to have some successful partnerships with um, our vendor with Straighter Line. Um, and that was very important as well as um, implementing some project management methodology and rigor around an initiative like this, where there's deadlines and things that need to happen from a technical and an academic perspective, and as well as making sure that the, the communication internal and external was done in an appropriate way. And so we did it as a phased pilot approach. Um, and we were able to um, start um, implementing our first phase in the fall. And so Utah State leaders, we knew we needed to have a flexible, low cost solution to help our students where they were. We also knew that we needed a technology solution that would allow us to rapidly scale this effort. And even with our large enrollment management team we have here at Utah State, we realized that we needed a partner to help us meet this personalization, this coaching and the mentoring needs 
that come with um, a successful earned admission programs. And this led us to, um, to partner with Straighter Line, which um, we created a, um, a very similar uh, college readiness program. And we entered into this planning stage um, early in April of 2020. And our academic leaders um, on our campus, we worked to include all the stakeholders as needed for discussions. Um, we faculty were involved and they were eager, eager to have their voices in this conversation alongside of our administrators. And together um, we began to outline the courses we'd offer as well as our high level goals and outcomes for this program. And then we worked really, um, really carefully and closely with Straighter Line to plan out the student's journey. And the pilot was officially implemented um, in the summer of 2020 with Straighter Line providing um, a dedicated support team. Um, with we had advisor training, we did outreach and marketing communication and had student support. And initially we offered this program to 300 students who had initially been denied an entry to our university that previous year. And then we had 30 of our students take advantage of this new pathway and program. And currently to date, we have um, this, next, this year, we have about 162 students that have taken advantage of this pathway and um, have had a 100% admission rate into Utah State University. And so as we did this pilot, we, um, we also had on campus um, a parallel prod, a pilot that we used to call, um, we used to call it our, um, um, like prep academy is what we call it. And it was the university's similar thing of helping students come in that weren't ready to have the pre-coursework or to have some remedial coursework in different areas to help them and to create a path. And so we ran both of these programs parallel um, during that year, the pilot program, as well as our current one. And then um, we were able to take the data and the learning analytics and the data from that and the students experienced some qualitative and quantitative data and compare the two. And then we were able to um, start planning in an implementation for phase two for another um, phase of the project where we, where we changed it and um, we moved forward. And the, where we're moving forward to for the future um, in the next slide, um, we are going to um, be implementing it this year as well. And this year we are going to be um, actually launching a little bit more broader um, straight with straighter line and having um, the, our new earned admission program actually replace the prep academy program um, and be able, and now it's part of kind of just our process for enrollment and admissions now, it's just a new pathway that we've adopted and that we are launching in this next year and, um, and we're moving forward. So we're not denying students anymore. We are um, actually um, helping meet where they are at and help them have a low um, risk opportunity to be successful and to thrive as an Aggie at our institution. And so we've been very excited and very um, happy with um, where we're at and we're learning as we go and we're still learning. And, um, and that's been kind of what we've done in the last year or so. And so um, I guess I can stop there and um, see if there are any questions. Randy, thank you so much um, for the presentation. So let's let's jump in with, with the other panelists, Bernard and Amy, we're gonna bring you into this conversation as well. Randy, let me start with you. Um, how have the broader enrollment trends impacted this program and Utah State's commitment to the new to new pathways? Yeah, I mean, from a broad perspective, I think every um, all of a lot of institutions across the nation are you know um, are being impacted by the enro enrollment decline and for, and and the it's it's something that every that we're all having to deal with and I think that um, the way that it's impacted us at Utah State is it's us trying this new pilot program and and being open to innovation and thinking about new ways of doing things is actually um, I think that it's going it's it's actually been a positive thing because we have been able to. Um, to um, broaden our enrollment um, student population. And that's been, I think that's been very valuable for us. That's great, thank you so much. And uh, Bernard, let me follow on in terms of getting your perspective on what are some of the common challenges that the land grant universities are facing right now 
that an earned admissions program could address. Uh, thank you, uh, Felice, and thank you for that uh, great presentation, Renee. Um, so, you know, challenges, there are some common challenges. Um, now, one of the common challenges is, um, and we are very aware of this at the national level, is the if, uh, lack, of, lack of effectiveness of remediation programs. Students who traditionally, um, like the USU case, um, are not prepared for admission to the university um, are play, often placed in these remedi remedial courses, primarily in math and English. And it has been demonstrated both at an individual institution level and nationally that these do not really work, okay? Um, for, for many, many reasons, which we don't have time to go into here. So that is one of the challenges. How do we <clears throat> develop what is now called co-remedial remediation courses that will produce, that will give students the degree, the college credit at the same time as addressing their gaps. And addressing gaps has been an issue that has been uh, at the prime, at the, at the front of many of our institutions, pretty much all of our institutions. These gaps occur not just at the high school level. I would dare to say that they occur at all throughout every transition phase at the, at the transfer level, and even at the graduate level, we still have these challenges that we have to face. And so universities have developed all kinds of bridge programs that, depending on the characteristics, have been quite effective. Some are not so effective. Um, the, you know, that was pre-COVID. COVID changed everything. <laughs> and um, one of the um, things that we are concerned about, and, and our institutions have brought this to our attention, is uh, the COVID effects which have produced learning loss in our high school students. Um, so that has been a really, really serious concern. Um, and anecdotally, some institutions report weaker performance, um, especially in STEM courses. They are less prepared for the amount of work expected in college. Their high school grades were assigned in less systematic ways than normal, so they are not effective predictors of success. And, and, and I could go on, we could, we could get into more detail later. But I think um, the, the need for these kinds of interventions, these kinds of bridge programs tailored to your specific goals and, uh, and needs is a really, really great way to address whatever um, issues that you're facing. And I would say, you know, the, what I look at as the five features of this program is worth emulating um, in whatever way that the institution finds suitable. I, I think of the quality aspect of this, that it was designed by USU faculty and appropriate for their institution. The access, the ease, ease of access, the price, the pace that is self-paced, and the support mechanisms that, that um, these, these courses include. So I think any, any, th those are five essential ingredients that institutions should look at when they're developing their interventions. Yeah, good points, Bernard. Um, I'm gonna come back. We have a couple of questions from, from the attendees. So um, Renee, back, back to you on this one, which is how is this paid for? And how do the finances work? Could you give an, an overview of that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in our partnership with Straighter Line, we, um, we wanted this to be something that was very low cost and that there was um, an opportunity for the students to be able to take as long as they need or as short a time as they need that um, to be able to be successful. And so we actually, um, it's a subscription model. So students, when we did our pilot, this, we had three courses that we made available. And these three courses, um, students would pay um, $125 a month to have access to all these three courses and all of the learning resources that come available with that. And these students um, would take these courses and they could take all three of them at once or they could take one at a time. Um, but it's a very, it was a very low cost um, subscription model that the students could then um, 
that they could do before they even come to college. And then also, if they need a full year to work on math, they could take a full year to work on math. And this wouldn't, you know, impact their financial aid. It wouldn't impact their um, transcripts. We wanted to make sure that, that, that those things would not be impacted by that. And so um, for the pilot, we actually um, had the students would pay that um, so that there is a little bit of skin in the game and that there was a little bit of commitment, but not so much that it would be um, hard for them. Um, we also, if they didn't have the money to, if they are, we had, um, we, we, Utah State had programs and a way to, to help them with that. Um, and then as we roll out for the future and as we're moving forward with this new earned pathway, we are actually going to um, um, offer, we've, you know, we're going to offer some scholarships um, around this to help cover some of these costs and that that we're working on as well. So that's how we did it um, is through a subscription model. I hope that helped answer the question. I yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah. Thanks. And let me, um, there's another follow up uh, for you, which is uh, just a, cl and a clarification. So students in the prep academy were not admitted students or were they provisionally admitted? How did you manage the admissions um, in moving them from can candidates that you might have rejected, but now you understand there's potential in building this type of program and in creating this type of alternate pathway. But how were you, how did you um, manage the admissions and were they formally admitted or was it based on completion? So, um they were um, non-admitted students during the time that they were working on their coursework um, with Strader Line. And then when they were completed, um, then they would become, an, they would start the admissions process and become um, a um, admitted student um, with Utah State in good standing. They would just start in and then they would get to move forward as if they, you know, they, they basically had earned their admissions and they got to move forward. Um, and we set up kind of a, we set up a process um, where we, when they would finish this coursework, then um, a kind of a certificate would happen and then we would be notified. And then um, our, we work really um, hand in hand with the Straighter Line team so that our admissions counselors now, they, um, they work in collaboration with the, our Straighter Line partners and they do it together now. So for the new program moving forward, we're actually going to even integrate that a little bit more. And for the future, um, if they take, um, the, we're requiring one course, um, which is a student success course. And then the other ones are optional. Um, once they take the student success course, um, then they become um, an admitted students and they'll actually get, um, they can transfer that credit in and get credit for the course that they took um, prior to their being admitted. So we are making that change for the future. That's great. And um, do you do you have um, numbers? We have another question. Uh, and and folks uh, who are attendees, please keep sending in the questions, and we'll we'll just keep taking them in order. Uh, one participant asked, "Do you have any numbers on the average length it takes for students from the point they enter into the program to become college ready? Is there an average that you're seeing? It's a subscription model." How are students um, moving through that? And, and then I have a follow-up, which is once you then admit them, are you seeing that they're then um, making an easy transition? And this has been my understanding of this, of this initiative, is that in fact, they're, they're able to make a successful and easy transition into a full program. But what is, what's sort of the average length uh, to become college ready? You know, for the students that we are, um, like our Utah State students, um, it's actually, um, and, and, and Amy may be able to, she probably actually has the actual data with that, um, but we, it's, it's shorter than we anticipated. It was actually shorter than we anticipated. We thought that it might take longer, um, but it, it, it has been shorter than we anticipated, but, and it has been individual. I mean, some students, like we had one student who was able to you know, do the do all three courses in like six weeks, and then she was able to admit, be admitted, you know, in that in that same term. We also uh, make sure like that we give them like kind of timeline and deadlines so that they kind of have guiding guideposts to help them, you know. So if they want to come for fall, then you know you need to have your coursework done by July, and we help them with that as well. We kind of give them those guiding posts, but. But it's, it's, it's their choice. It's the student's choice. Amy, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Amy, please jump in. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> on average, a student at Strader Line, and particularly Rini's students at Utah State, 
they, they finish a course in about five weeks. Some exactly as Rini said, if you need to do college algebra and take three or four months, you absolutely can and you can get tutored at midnight if that's if that's your need. But normally it's about four to five weeks um, and sometimes usually no later than six. So students are they they take about three months before they're admitted for the next term. And that's a, again, there are outliers to that, but that's sort of the super normal, if you will. Yeah. Thank you, Amy, and thanks for jumping in on that. And let me uh, stay with you, Amy, in terms of talk a little bit more about what has impressed you the most about Utah State's programs and results, because you work with a number of institutions and, and I've known Straighter Line and the work that's been done for years now since I was at the New York Times and, and first became aware of this work. But it does seem um, pretty exceptional in terms of what we're seeing with Utah State and the model that they've built, which is really intentional and thoughtful and very student-centered. But what impresses you the most about, about what you're seeing from the program and the results? A couple things um, that make Utah State just a rock star at how they think about it. First, they, and Rini, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so forgive me. Uh, they genuinely believe everybody can and should be an Aggie. They just, they do. They're like, oh my God, the whole world could be an Aggie. The entire state could be. So they're about what could be and how it can happen. And so because of that philosophy, they start where students start. So they're not thinking about where they want you to end up. Although, of course, they want you to graduate, matriculate into a program and graduate, but they're thinking about where you are when you knock on their door. And so when they build the program, they thought about all of the supports and structures and prods and guard posts and guardrails uh, and cheerleading and celebration a student would need to be successful. And they built that in. So they thought about the student journey as, a, as an individual student, not a collection of students who aren't yet admitted or aren't yet ready. They thought about them as individual humans. That made this very, very different and I think highly successful. The other thing that makes Utah such a rock star is they watch their students. They know who they are, what their names are. We partner with them very closely, but on any given Tuesday, they know who's doing what, where, when, and why, and how's Amy doing in her math class. And they can actually answer that question. That helps them help students. So there's something about their belief that everybody should be an Aggie and can be, and their belief that you should really start where a student starts and that students, while they're a group and they're a collective and there's a cohort, they also are really individuals. And so we have to teach the individual student. Rini, do you wanna add anything to that or, or, or push, push back on my thinking? No, I think, no, you were exactly right. I mean, that was one of the biggest concerns, um, you know, that our faculty, when we were talking about this pilot and trying to think through the possibilities of what we would do early on in the planning, was that there, there was a great pride in um, our ability to, you know, being able to support and coach and mentor these students. And we wanted to make sure that if we did partner with someone that that same approach happened consistently across the pilot. Um, and and the, in here at the institution, we realized we didn't have all of the resources that we need at a public um, land grant school. We just we didn't have we don't have all of the resources and, and be able to do that. And so that's why we you know that's why we looked to, to doing some type of a partnership because we really do believe. Um, I have to laugh because I do I attend supporting events here at Utah State, and Utah State gets a lot of um, mileage for our. Um, our, our students um, at their games and, and the thing. And one of the cheers that they always do is, um, I believe that you will win. I believe that we will win. And like that is in our athletic program. And it's also in our classrooms, people like we believe in people. And so it, um, I mean, that's, it, it just comes across from sports into academics and into life. And I agree. I completely agree with that. That's great. So, yeah. Thank you. Another uh, just logistics and operations question uh, that uh, Rennie, Amy, uh, either one jump in. Uh, uh, question about what are the costs to the university of developing course materials, providing support, et cetera. So when you think about what, what it takes to do this program in terms of costs, and I would say also staff, uh, how many, what staff do you have dedicated to this? And the assumption is that in, from the attendee is that presumably this costs more than the subscription fees provided. 
Uh, so how do you cover that when you're talking about making this very, uh, you know, accessible and low cost? Uh, how do you how do you manage that balance there? Rini, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, let me start with this one. So um, there's a, there's two things to consider, right? First of all, you need to think about the implement, implementation costs because to get started and to do um, a pilot or a project, there are implementation costs that are internal and external. Um, internal, I mean, there are internal people and their time and them and their their time that they take to work on a project like this, right? And that that does in that does cost the institution money. Um, you know, that's their biggest resources, their people. And so there is the implementation cost. So we did have a, um, a project team of about um, six or seven people that worked on this project for um, probably like oh, 20 percent or 10 10 percent of their job, like for about six months. So there was that commitment. Um, from a, and then additionally, we had a faculty, um, we had our provost office and our uh, vice provost was involved during the summer months, especially because uh, the courses that we selected and we decided to go with, they were evaluated by our faculty and the learning outcomes were matched and um, evaluated and that took time. Um, and so there was that. But now that we've done that pre-work and that implementation work, now we are operational. And so there are operational costs. So for example, we have three or four people in our admissions office that they that this is part of their job and it's become operational and it has replaced something. So once it becomes operational, it, it becomes affordable because you can take something off your plate that you weren't doing and do this instead. So we have been you know, un, undoing our prep academy and then those efforts are being placed on this new earned admissions program. So there are hidden costs. Um, and it just depends on um, how you organize. And that's part of that project management rigor. You have to decide how to organize as an institution. At Utah State, we decided to pilot it because pilots are, um, you wanna learn, that's how we learn. You've gotta do it. Um, and so we learned a little bit and then we were able to operationalize that. And I think that saved us money rather than trying to do too much, if that makes sense. It does, thank you so much. Bernard, let's pick your brain a little bit in terms of where we are um, in, in terms of enrollment and enrollment declines and where we are, what you're seeing in the landscape here. Um, give us some background on the enrollment declines uh, that you're seeing among the APLA members. How, how long lasting do you project the declines to be? And um, where you think um, some, of the, some of the pain will disappear in terms of, of enrollment declines? Um, yeah, so generally, I think overall, um, I don't think there is significant enrollment decline across the entire APLU membership. Now, um, you know, the actual enrollment pattern depends on the location of the institution, um, as you can tell. And so the story is very different um, for different kinds of institutions. Um, in general, the larger um, public research universities um, experienced probably a little bit of an enrollment decline when COVID hit, but then um, for the six, for the for 21 and um, for 22, some are reporting actually, some are actually reporting largest um, numbers of applications received this year. Um, there may be several reasons for that, maybe the common app, the lack of um, the, the the lack of re reliance on standardized scores and 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 so and so so we don't know what will actually happen this year. Um, some are actually reporting some reported some increases last year after declines in twenty, and so the story is mixed. But overall, I think the APLU membership as a block is doing okay. But there are some schools that are really concerned about, about their enrollment declines. Um, and so there is an effort to tap the um, non-traditional learner markets, students who have stopped out, students who have traditionally not been admitted and providing the kind of access that USU has provided to increase, to, to increase um, access. And although these are financially motivated, the, the leadership realizes this is really what we should be doing in any case. 
to serve our students because of the land grant mission and because of the public university mission to educate the general population. So we're, the, the finances are actually putting us, <laughs> causing us to make right decisions, um, which, which, is, which is really great. Um, but the, the real, um, there is concern about the success, the student success rates that we will see due to the effects of, of COVID on the high school generation. Um, and so that's what I referred to earlier. Um, and what, what our membership is really concerned about, a large part of our membership is concerned about addressing the achievement gaps between traditionally underrepresented students and the general population. That's really a big focus of a large group of universities in our membership. Um, we did see, we have some preliminary data, of course, we don't have achievement gaps. We don't have graduation rates for new cohorts, but between um, the 19 and the, the, between 19 and 20, between 18 and 19, with those two cohorts, we actually saw um, retention rate changes. And this is pre-COVID, right? Um, so we don't know what will happen um, with, the, with the 2020 cohort. Um, but the good news there is that the achievement gap for African-American students against white or the overall population was really narrowed in the, in the retention rates. So re the black African-American retention rates we saw amongst a, a number of our schools, a large number of our schools, about half of our membership um, went, went, went up. The retention rates really went up by about five points. Yeah. Um, and, and, and these are the schools that are involved in our Powered by Publics initiative, right. which, which, seeks, which is focused on student success, which is focused on narrowing the achievement gap and employ you know, a variety of techniques ranging from teaching and learning to build programs, to holistic student supports and to the cost um, question the affordability issue that students face. Um, we think though that COVID will really put a damper on, on, the, on the progress we have made because of the learning loss and um, anecdotal evidence indicates, yes, it, we are waiting for the data, but we are, we, are, we are concerned that we may see a reversion back to previous situations. Yeah, the, the sense I, I get as well is that um, there's students are dealing are bringing in all of the past year and a half with them and really uh, are hungry and need additional social support mental health support uh, uh, support in navigating the transition from time out of school time out of that type of environment and back in it seems that this would um this is a good moment in time for programs like what USU has launched, um, something that is so very intentional, so comprehensive, really uh, wraps the students in support services, the ability to complete and become college ready. So um, a, a question I have and, and for the entire panel is, so, so given the USU model, which, which is an exemplar model that is achieving some, some pretty significant results that is providing a type of service for students that has the potential to serve all students, but specifically, hopefully also close equity gaps for the student uh, populations that Bernard mentioned. How do you ensure that if you, if you engage in this program, if you open the access up in this way, that you're truly giving all learners the opportunity, that you're really helping all learners become successful, that you're also paying attention to the equity gaps, as Bernard mentioned, and um, really looking at a program that creates both the true pathway, um, true access, true support, and, and really truly a pathway to completion. How do you ensure that? when you're launching this type of program. And Rennie, you're speaking from experience. Amy, you've seen a number of models across. Bernard, you know from the student success work that you've been doing with the Powered by Publix, but, but I'll jump in. And Amy, I think you're, you're gonna kick yeah. us off, 
right? <laughs> yeah, you guys can see me jump at my screen. A couple of things I think about when we think about achievement gaps and equity, uh, different students need different things. They need different kinds or levels of support. They need different ways to identify when they're struggling. They need different ways to reflect on their own learning while they're, while they're in flight inside of a class. They need different ways to access content. You know, some people are gonna wanna watch the video and others are gonna wanna read the transcript of the video and listen to the podcast and check in on the chapter. And some people wanna take the quiz before they even start reading to see where they are. So it's about creating a course and an experience that's an ecosystem that serves every student. That's the challenge. So we have a question in the chat with no disrespect to straighter line. Thank you for saying that, that's very kind. And Rini, I'm gonna pass this one back to you, I promise really fast. Um, you know, why would you go with a third party, like as opposed to build it yourself? Cause that's one of the great things we do as institutions, we build it ourselves. That's, that's our core competency, right? Academic programming. One of the things that straighter line does is we wrap services around a student 24 seven. You actually can get tutored in math Sunday at 6 a.m. if you want to with a live person. You can schedule your final exam for Monday at 6 a.m. before you go to work. You can talk to a counselor on a Sunday or Saturday afternoon when you're tired and just trying to figure out how to time manage and work on your coursework while you're putting kids to bed at night. There are a thousand different needs a student may have. And so one of the benefits of partnering with a straighter line is scale. I mean, how do you tutor that many subjects 365 days a year, 24 seven, like that's an engine, right? So because we've done those types of supports for so long, it's one of our strengths. And so we can lend that to the institution and they can lean on us for that core competency because that's one of the things we're good at. But Rini, I want to throw that one at you. Well, and before before you throw it to Rini, I want to follow up on one thing because Rini talked uh, talked about their sort of their skin in the game uh, at USU in terms of what they put into this in terms of allocation of of resources and staff. And so, Amy, could you speak to uh, mm -hmm. the question of cost to the university and and what Straighter Line really does bring in this yeah. in terms of infrastructure and investment? So for Straighter Line, we don't charge the university to, to set courses up or, or you know, put uh, Utah State's branding onto a landing page and all of that technology interface. That's the investment we invest in the partnership. That's the risk that we take and we want to take. So we want to help the partner help their students. That's ultimately the goal. Our ultimate goal is if a student is successful, meaning passes a course, moves in a program, continues with their higher ed academic journey, then everybody wins. That's the end game is student success. So for us, we, much like Rini said, we have implementation teams and project teams, and our role is to lead that and to own that burden and own that work. The more integrated we are with an institution, Rini gave a great example of her six month project team, um, the better the partnership, and the more successful the students because it becomes seamless. We become an arm of the institution and that makes it much easier. But there are no upfront costs to an institution to set up a partnership. It's exactly really what Rini said. It's the internal staff human resources um, that we partner with to make happen. So thank you for asking for that clarification. Sure. Rini, anything to add? Yeah, I do want to add, um... Um, I've been I've been doing higher I'm in higher ed for a couple decades now, and I've done a lot of technology implementations or um, programmatic. You know, I've worked at Western Governors, I've worked at Southern New Hampshire, and now I'm back in the public ed space because that's I really want to make a difference in the public education and the land grant models. And I think that um, there's a lot of pride in our institutions um, around our our university brand and what we do. And like I love that question about you know why don't why is USU not using your courses? And um, I think I, what I'd like to say on that topic is that um, as we scale, as we try to scale as institutions to meet the workforce needs and meet these access needs and equity needs, um, we don't necessarily have um, the ability to do it without having some really good partnerships. And I have found in the past, as I've done different things at different universities, selecting the right technology or ed tech vendor partner is is important you have to make sure that your values align you have to make sure that 
you um, like their, their product and their services and it aligns with your institution mission. And that's why I always do a pilot because it's important to try it out and to get to know each other because the best way to build trust and to build those relationships is to work on something important together, right? To work on an initiative. So anyone out there that's thinking about this from a public institution perspective, it's important to be willing to be open to, to partnerships with vendor partnerships, um, to pilot stuff and to, to try it out. And if it doesn't work, go back and talk about it and be open about it and say, this isn't working or this is working. And then to, to do that together in a partnership because it is all about that scalability. The reason we did not do, um, we did that here at Utah State and we partnered with Straighter Line is because we did not have the internal resources to do it the way we wanted. We wanted coaching. We wanted 24-7 um, help, tutoring. We wanted to make sure that um, people had some a mentor along the way. And we just internally didn't have, we don't have the, the scalability to do that at this point right now. And so that's why we decided to do it and to partner with a vendor. Um, I think that um, also with that is um, I'd like to say on that topic is that, um, you know, being able to do that with and finding the right partnerships is really important and being able to make sure that you you can still have pride in your brand and that they, that's why we had the faculty involved up front and they reviewed the courses and the learning outcomes and we made sure that it met our quality and it met our standards and then we felt comfortable in being able to do that. And then we were able to scale and offer our students. We had a lot of things happen. We have a lot of post-traditional students at Utah State. And when COVID hit, we had a lot of high school students that didn't go anywhere and they were in the middle of things. And we were really based on a semester, fall, spring semester. And we had students, high school students that needed something. And so this was a solution at that time to help students start school and stop school no matter where they were, right? They could stop. So we had high school students that were taking classes because they weren't in high school anymore because schools weren't on during 2020. And this allowed us to let those students come in and start preparing for college online in a successful, scalable way. So I just, I sorry, I just, I think that was really important to like, it really is about trust and making sure you align. Great, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question about the challenges because nothing is ever goes quite as smoothly as we uh, imagine it or anticipate. But first, let me ask uh, this, and and please, everyone, use the Q and A to continue to pose questions. So for this question, uh, for some students, they may be strong in every other area other than math. So say they're they're struggling in just one area. Did you deny these students in the past? So they're, they look, they're good in every area but one. Did you deny these students in the past and will you insist they address this area with straighter line in the future? Um, we are actually looking at that really closely right now as we're doing our, our as our pilot and then as we move into this new future um, operational earned admission program, we're gonna be keeping an eye on that. Um, but yes, in the past, if their math scores and that didn't, you know, meet our standards, then they did, they would get denied. Um, they also, you know, they also, a lot of public schools, we have them come in and then we take them, have them take, you know, the placement, the math placement exams or the Alex, and that also holds students up because then they have to take remedial courses and to get there and it sometimes that messes up with their financial aid. And so we're watching this very carefully and we're keeping the straighter line math um, availability for these students and then their advisors. And we may in the future may have them do that, but we're gonna learn from this next year and then decide on how we're going to handle that. But yes, we used to do that. And we're hoping that those, those students that need that help will, will take advantage of this opportunity to um, address that. Great. So Rini, Amy, Bernard, let's just talk a little bit about the challenges. Um, so Rini and Amy, challenges that you actually faced, right? What are some of the challenges you've encountered with earned admission pathways? How did you address them? Um, so whoever wants to jump in and, and kick us off, but we'll, we'll go around to everyone in terms of, of, of what you might see or, or as potential challenges and then, and then, then how did you address them in real life? And then, and then Bernard, from your take, if, if this were truly to go to scale across 
um, the land, you know, the APLU institutions or even across APLU ASCU institutions, what, what might be some challenges and what might be some ways to address those? You guys, can I start? I'll start. Sure, so please, Amy. And then yep. pack it. Okay. A couple of challenges we see, uh, and I put it in the chat because uh, it, it hadn't come up earlier, but it reminded me, flexibility is a challenge. When you have term starts, regardless of four week term, eight week, 12 week, 15 week semesters, quarter based, whatever that term start is for title four, a student have to wait to get into a slot. Right. And so one of the key challenges for a student is flexibility. One of the things we are able to overcome both for title four and flexibility is we can start whenever. One, and the reason I bring that up during challenge is that's a student challenge, but it was also an institutional challenge because that was a new idea. You mean you can sign up and start tomorrow morning? This afternoon, really? That's very different. And that's outside of the normal boundaries. So in this type of program and partnership, and Rini had brought it up at the very beginning, she said innovative, and that's in her title. <laughs> I smile very respectfully, Rini, as I say that. Um, it, you have to think a little bit differently, and it has to be okay to think differently. Mm -hmm. That's the one challenge. The other challenge I'll bring up, Rini mentioned it as well, uh, and then I'll pause, is making sure that your implementation and integration teams, everybody's a part of it. You can't leave faculty out, enrollment teams, advising has to be aware. So while that sounds big and large, it is manageable. But at every layer and level of an institution that touches a student's experience has to be part of communications and has to be part of the process in some large or small way. When we do it that well, then those partnerships in, in our experience are very, very successful. And I'll pause with that. Thanks for letting me start, you two. Amy, uh, thank you so much. Rennie? Yeah, um, I agree completely. And that's why I shared the slides um, about those, the four things I think are really important to be successful with any pilot or any technical or program um, implementation is you need to have high level sponsorship. So you've got to, you've got to have the right sponsor who's helping you, who's paying for it, who's giving you the permission and the flexibility to do it. You've got to be inclusive with your stakeholders. And that is exactly what Amy said. For us, a challenge was, um, you know, there's with anything, there's always um, the kind of the faculty buy-in and the academic um, barriers that come with that, with higher ed. And so, you know, we, we made sure early on to have those stakeholders around the table in those conversations so that we could um, be effective in managing them. But it was a challenge, like, you know, our pilot going out the out the door, we couldn't give them college credit for the courses they were taking for the pilot. But then after we had six months of it and the faculty that were involved got familiar with it and they saw the results and the data, then we, they felt comfortable in making the decision for this next year to allow those students to get the credit, the college credit they wanted. So, so that's a challenge and you have to have a good communication strategy and a good, um, and that's when that project management comes in because all of those pieces of initiation and planning and execution all come together in, in something like this. So, but, but it's a challenge um, and communication is really key um, and that's how we addressed it. Thank you. Thank you, Rini. Bernard, challenges, opportunities that you see across the APLU uh, or higher ed landscape? So first, um, let me just say, these are my personal opinions and <laughs> do not reflect the views of APLU. <laughs> But um, I, I like what I'm hearing. I mean, I think USU and Straight Line did a, a real great job in addressing um, all the possible challenges that could arise. I mean, the faculty buy-in and acceptance is, I think, the biggest challenge of all of them. I mean, the program management and the organization, you can deal with that and you can accomplish those. But the confidence and the faculty buy-in and ac accepting of that program is, I think, the biggest challenge because there are so many different opinions. And it, 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 did, it did show up in the chat, right? Why should, why, should, why should USU hire a third party to do this, right? Why can't USU, why can't each institution address the problems they face and make it a homegrown solution at every step of the way? And I think if we think of it in a larger scale, we are all in this together, that we all accept each other's courses at, at some level, at some point in time, if we are going to meet the educational challenges we face, we have to rely on each other. It has to be collaborative. 
we can't go, each institution cannot do it on their own, right? So, so why not have a, a larger tent rather than trying to um, address all the challenges that you face as an institution that your students face as a student at your institution on your own? You will not be able to do that. I mean, that's, that defies the definition of scale. And um, scale is very important now. It's one of the things that we are facing. We have all these pilot programs. We have these ways that we can address small groups of students, but we are faced with educating a large number of students who have stopped out of school, are facing tremendous debt, have, 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 have locked out of their career options. And, and we really do need to do something about that. And the only way we can address those um, difficult situations, the difficult issues is to be creative, innovative, and with opening arms, welcome everyone to the table to be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. um, and as I think back as, <clears throat> as an administrator at a, at a university, one of the things is if I look at the accreditation, the accreditation opens the door for this. It only says that 25% of your degree program needs to be pro provided by the home institution. And that, there's a reason for that. It recognizes the fact that we need to be collaborative and develop innovative ways that we can collaborate with other entities to provide the avenues of opportunity to our students. So, so this is a great solution to, to the problem that we face. And um, as I said, although I cannot endorse straight line <laughs> on behalf of APLU, I will say that what I'm hearing here today is, I mean, I mean the collaboration is terrific. It has all the ingredients of a successful collaboration. It has addressed all the issues that I think are important. And um, the fact that it is, there is such a close collaboration between the two groups and that they are talking to each other, they are working out issues together and, and that they discuss student success and the issues that students faced while they are in the Sri Lankan course. And that USU is intimately involved in the progress of these students, I think is a key to success. Yeah. Well said, and I think that brings us just about to time. Um, I think, in, in effect, what could have been the greatest challenges, collaboration, quality, time for completion, the pathway uh, approach, and really providing the services, have turned into also some of the greatest assets uh, if, in terms of this, this pilot and this case study. So thank you so much. Uh, Rini, for, for engaging in the case study and sharing it with us and sharing the success of the work that you've been engaged in and the pathway that you've taken. Amy, thank you for the partnership that you've provided and for the thinking in terms of how this is structured. Bernard, thank you so much for your national perspective and your deep understanding of the higher education landscape and where this type of partnership and work might fit in ultimately in terms of helping uh, all students achieve success at our institutions. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. If you'd like to dive into the Utah State Case Study, you can find it at partners.straighterline.com. And um, Irina has also put her, generously put her email address there for you to contact her and please feel free to reach out to her with questions. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Rini, Bernard, Amy, uh, for for providing such a great insight into uh, a really promising program. Thank you. Thank you, Felice. Thank, Thank you, Felice. You.